This morning, um, we're going to listen for the Word of God as heard in the words of the Old Testament passage from 1 Kings. I'm going to invite you to listen as these words are shared as a narrative with several speakers. And because we don't have the technology, I'll have to explain just a little bit. Um, the um, voices that will be read and used, we will hear the voice of King Solomon. We will hear the voice of the two women. This is a familiar passage from um, First Kings where there was the death of a baby. And we have two children, we have two women that will be reading as well those parts. And in addition, we will hear the voice of the Lord. It's important to remember the voice of the Lord is going to come from above. <laughs> but, um, you know, we often think of the Lord and we use the word he. But if we read the whole of Scripture, we know that God wasn't a man. All of us know that even when we use the word he. Um, scripture tells us that um, uh, humankind was made in the image, our image. Um, God is neither male nor female. So uh, we will hear the words of the Lord read in this familiar passage. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible, you're welcome to, but I think the words will be um, clear as they're shared as well. And I will be the narrator. Stand. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer a thousand birth offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in, dr in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness and in uprightness of heart towards you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord, my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or how to come in. And your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern between good and evil, for who can govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this, and so God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall rise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Then Solomon awoke. It had been a dream. He came to Jerusalem where he stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. He offered up burnt offerings and offerings of well-being and provided a feast for all his servants. Later, two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, Please, my lord, this woman and I live in the same house, and I gave birth while she was in the house. Then on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. We were together. There was no one else with us in the house. Only the two of us were in the house. Then this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your servant slept. She laid him at her breast and laid her dead, dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, clearly it was not the son I had born. 
But the other woman said, No, the living son is mine, and the dead son is yours. The first said, No, the dead son is yours, and the living son is mine. So they argued before the king. Then the king said, The one says, This is my son that is alive, and your son is dead. While the other says, Not so, your son is dead, and my son is the living one. So the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. The king said, Divide the living boy in two, then give half to the one and half to the other. But the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because compassion for her son burned within her, Please, my lord, give her the living boy. Certainly do not kill him. The other said, It shall, it shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide it. Then the king responded, Give the first woman the living boy. Do not kill him. She is his mother. All Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered, and they stood in awe of the king, because they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you. I spoke this week with a friend who has a family member who lives in that very small town in South Carolina where the $1.5 billion lottery ticket was won. Since it's such a small town, this person's relative called him up just to let him know that he was not the person who won the lottery ticket. Thoughts of early retirement and long extended quest, um, vacations quickly and sadly drifted away. Yet it does raise the question that's often asked. If you won the lottery, what would you do with all that money? Now, maybe you've been a part of those discussions with family or friends, and you've talked about it with them, about how I would spend that money if I had it. We always like to think that we'd be one of those folks, you know, that give the looking good kind of answer. You know, you would take care of your family, You'd give to the church, you'd give to your favorite charities and others in need. You know, the sort of looking good kinds of answers. But sadly, if you read the news and you follow some of the lottery winners, too often that initial looking good answer leads to a much sadder outcome of family discord, lost opportunities, and squandered wealth. Which brings us to our story of Solomon. Just to put the story in context, last week in following the narrative lectionary, we would have read about King David and Bathsheba, the birth of their first son that died, and then the birth of their son Solomon. And in the ensuing years of David's family experience, there was considerable turmoil lots of scandal, and much rebellion. And so the book of Kings, which is kind of where we're starting today, it opens with the words, Now King David was old, and he was stricken in years. And then it tells the efforts of Adonijah, who is the half-brother of Solomon. He wanted to become king. Now Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, she complained to David about it right away and she reminded him of his promise that Solomon would inherit the throne. So on his deathbed, David gathered the powers to be, if you will, those who could declare him king, and they did. They proclaimed Solomon king and it kind of left Adonijah in the dust. By chapter 2, 
King David um, has died, and Solomon begins his efforts to consolidate his reign. And that was sort of typical of what was going on during that day. And so what you did was you married the daughter of another king nearby, and Solomon did that. He married the daughter of Pharaoh, even though Jewish law forbids marriage, marriages outside of their faith. But if he married Pharaoh's daughter, you know, then Pharaoh probably wouldn't come up and um, go to battle with Solomon and his people. So as Solomon was settling into his role as king, we read that while he was in Gibeon, which was just a few miles northwest of Jerusalem, he had this dream in which the Lord asks him that million billion dollar lottery question. Ask what I should give you. Imagine. Ask what I should give you. It's the kind of offer that people dream about, an open-ended offer, if you will, and an offer of assistance by an almighty being. It's the kind of offer that unveils, if you will, the heart of the recipient. Will Solomon give one of those looking good answers? This offer to Solomon comes at a time in his life when he must have been, as Theo described it, kind of knock-kneed, you know, um, frightened. He was just a young king. And so the offer comes as an opportunity that would soothe and comfort and provide assurance to this young man. The Lord offers to give Solomon anything he wants. What do you want? And Solomon delivers a really remarkable answer. First, he begins by praising God's actions and steadfast love. And then Solomon admits his own weakness and his own inadequacy. He admits his own need for God's help. And so with an awareness of both of these things, Solomon asks for under an understanding mind, not to do math problems, an understanding mind and a listening heart. Regretfully, our English words do not really convey the richness of what Solomon asked for. Understanding is not mere cognition, mere thoughts of the mind. Rather, in Hebrew, the words convey the request for a moral compass, the desire, the ability to discern between good and evil. He asks for goodness as he carries out his reign as king. Solomon asks not just to listen, but to have the ability to obey God's statutes, to care for his people, to strive for justice, to lead by example. All the characteristics, really, that we look for in a good leader. But really, it's not just for leaders. Don't we all at times and actually for me lots of times, really pray for understanding and a listening heart. A prayer for wisdom as we make everyday decisions. Or a mother who in the midst of two screaming toddlers closes her eyes and calls on God to reveal to her how to best care for these little ones in her care right now. Or a father praying for wisdom as he supports his teenage son making significant life decisions, or grandparents needing wisdom and, and heart as they comfort their grieving child who is struggling with many of life's challenges. As I look out at all of you, there are prayers of wisdom I'm sure that each and, each and every one of you have made as you face decisions, as you have to make choices. The prayers are as varied and the need for wisdom as each and every one of us that are sitting here in this congregation. 
because the examples are endless. Maybe they're not as dramatic as the one from this passage. Solomon wisely determine, determining who is the mother of the baby by threatening to split the remaining baby in half and give each mother a half. Gruesome, horrible picture. But the point is that the wisdom Solomon acquired was so great that it saved the life of an innocent child and reunited a baby with his mother. Again, the examples from our own lives hopefully are not as dramatic, yet still as needy. Circumstances in which we breathe a prayer of, help me, I need your wisdom, O God. And they're just as welcomed by the Lord. But, just in case you're thinking, well, I guess I need to be just as wise, just as good, just as selfless as Solomon for God to even hear me. Because oftentimes in the reading of this story, that's the point that people take away, thinking that they have to be good and selfless like Solomon. It's important to look at the whole of Solomon's life. As someone said, he was no plaster saint. His life was messy. He got it right this time in his dream when he asked for wisdom. But if you read the rest of the book of Kings, you'll see that Solomon was a mix of complex motives and actions. Times when he worshipped the idols of the gods of his many wives, 700 wives, 300 concubines, not so wise, used slave labor to build his palaces and even the temple. But sometimes Solomon got it right. That's real life. Sometimes we get a win, sometimes we fail. Life is practice. Behaving well takes time, takes practice, takes experience. But God's love is wondrous because it loves us as we are when we look good and when we don't. Our congregations, too, are good when we become the perfect place for imperfect people. Peter Marty, the editor of Christian Century, wrote in a recent issue about a new member class that takes place in his church. At the end of the session, each participant is given a personal information form to complete in which they write down what they call a little bit different than what we call it, but they call it causes, passions, and commitments that figure into their lives. There's everything that's come through from tagging monarch butterflies to helping kids um, learn to swim, kids that have special needs, and helping them. Last spring, Marty writes, a participant wrote only four words in the box. Trying to be faithful. Trying to be faithful. Marty wrote, Peter Marty wrote, that he pondered those words late into the night, wondering if this woman was struggling with her past, was she having family difficulties? Whatever. You know, his mind just sort of spun out the possibilities. But as he got to know her over the next several months, the meaning became clear. She wasn't interested in nominal Christianity with a thin religious veneer covering over motives that are anything but religious. The Christian life means practice, practice, practice as we strive to live a life aligned with Jesus. She doesn't want to see how little she can do in life to be considered a Christian. She knows the Christian life is hard work in which we never become experts. How can we really, how could we ever possibly really become an expert at receiving the totally undeserved mercy of God on a daily basis? All we can do is keep practicing the faith. The late Maya Angelou, one of my favorites, she said it this way, I'm working at trying to be a Christian, and that's serious business. 
It's not something where you think, oh, I've got it all done. I did it all day. Hot diggity. The truth is, all day long, you try to do it. You try to be it. And then in the evening, if you're honest and you have a little bit of courage, you look at yourself and you say, hmm, I only blew it 86 times. And that's not bad. Amen.